wonderful grace you've given. Thank you, Cross Scout Troop. Thank you for all you're doing in our little fellowship to make a huge difference in the world because of you, Jesus. And so now speak to us from your word. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. So uh, this is uh, Genesis 18 where God has said that he is going to bring judgment, destruction on Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities there, because they're so wicked. And Abraham is concerned because his cousin, his nephew, Lot, is there. And so Abraham pleads for Sodom. And as um, he uh, intercedes with God, um, yeah, this is how he talks. So the man, that's uh, the Lord and the angels with him, and went towards Sodom. But Abraham remained there standing before the Lord. Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes. And the next scripture is Romans, 5, Romans 3, where Paul writes about the judgment of God. Romans 3, 25. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And then also about the justice, the judgment of God in John chapter 5, Jesus is speaking. John 5.22 The Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who doesn't honor the Son doesn't honor the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, the time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Yes, thank you, Lord. <clears throat> so we're looking through this uh, sermon series on the attributes of God. We first looked at the goodness of God. God is good. And all good things come from God. God is just solidly good. And then uh, we looked at the sovereignty of God. God is in control. And it's a huge relief through the trials, the upsets, the things that happen in life to know that God is in control. That God who brings good out of evil is in control. We looked at the holiness of God. And God says, you be holy because I am holy. God's call to us to be holiness. We looked at the wisdom of God, and particularly God's wisdom in the cross of Christ, a wisdom that no one would have forethought, no one would have suspected, and yet this brilliant solution to the problems of the world, the cross of Christ. And now we're going to look at the justice of God. God is just. Next week we'll look at the love of God, but now the justice of God. And in this world, to talk about the justice of God, people would say, where is God? A guy, Jim, had his breakfast, kissed his wife goodbye, got on the train, the commuter train, got off at the station. Thankful that his station was right in the basement of the building where he worked. A huge bank of elevators took thousands of workers up into the trade towers. He had his cup of coffee, got settled into work, and then he saw a blur outside the window. There's a plane heading right to the building. That was his last conscious thought. Where is God in there? Where is God in those crazy fanatics who carried that out? And on a small scale, there are tragedies that break our heart. A young wife dies of cancer, leaving a husband with two kids, and he can barely cope. And we say, where is God? Where is justice in this? Bad things happen to good people. And then, on the other hand, there's the good things that happen to bad people. Where I live, some years ago, a developer called Pacific Mountain Partners bought about 80 acres of a hillside around near our home. They cut down a lot of oak trees, made a huge mess, messed up the creek, uh, annoyed our neighbors, built a wall down the middle of our easement. They borrowed $25 million to do this. 
Some of it they borrowed from the Burlingame Police Department Pension Fund, among other places. They spent about 18 million <coughs> making a huge mess, and then they declared bankruptcy. And we strongly suspect they just went off with the other 7 million. Or Enron, you know, we all know that story. They knew that the stock was going downhill. They sold out, um, made away with their millions, and left a grandmother whose savings were all in Enron stock penniless. Where is God in this? And yet, we know that God is just. Scripture announces God is just. I put some of the scriptures about that here. Psalm 97, verse 2. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Or Romans chapter 2, um, this time in verse 5. <coughs> you are storing up against yourself wrath for the day of God's day. Staying against yourself. Storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. When his righteous judgment will be revealed, God will give each, to each person according to what he has done. To those who persistence in by doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First the Jew, then the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then the Gentile. For God doesn't show favoritism. And that's what we long for. We see this stuff happen. Bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. And we say, where's the justice? We have this inner sense that there is justice. Abraham, arguing with God about Sodom and Gomorrah, says, will not the judge of all the earth do right? He knows God, and he knows that God is just and works through justice. And yet, we see the world in such a mess. Justice. I mean, we're blessed to live in a country where there is an independent judiciary, where, to a pretty good extent, justice is fair. And yet, if you've got a lot of money, you can get a good lawyer. And you know cases where there's a guy who wants to divorce his wife and leave her penniless, and so he can get a good lawyer and fix it so he gets all the money. <clears throat> I have a friend who's a wonderful, devout, lovely Christian guy, just terrific. But he used to be a homeless amphetamine dealer, and he made a whole lot of money, and he got busted. But he'd saved his money very wisely, and so he was able to afford... Amphetamines are a horrible drug. They're terribly destructive. He was just making money out of destroying people's lives. Large amounts of money. He had a huge savings account, so he could get a really good lawyer and get off with probation. And now he's a Christian. He's changed his ways totally and reformed. In this life, there is not perfect justice. But God promises his justice is perfect. And so what is this about? The thing is, the world is fallen. We see the situation pictured in the first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, and the beginning of 3. It was very good. The first human beings had perfect access to God. We read about in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Total access, ease of fellowship with God. But then, inspired and lured, lured astray by a fallen angel and, <coughs> and a, a dis, um, an angel who, who was strictly shamed, Lucifer, they rebelled, they planned a coup. Instead of attacking God directly, just disobeyed, and sin came into the world, and from sin, all since then have fallen. We've all made bad choices in the course of our life, and this goes on in this time between what's pictured in Genesis chapter 3 and then in Revelation chapter 20, and I put this little timeline here. There's eternity past, the creation which God created, the world which was good. Genesis 1 and 2, a perfect world. And then Genesis chapter 3, the fall, until Revelation 20, this fallen world in which justice is not perfect. History is twisted and distorted and filled with pain. And then we see at the end of the Bible the promise of Revelation 21, 22, when there will be perfect fellowship between God. There will be no more sin, no more pollution, no more death. And we're living between, as it were, the bookends of Genesis 3 and Revelation 18, 19, 20, in which we live in this time in which the loving, perfectly just, compassionate, 
God is dealing with a world which is distorted and twisted and in many ways rebelling against him and making bad choices. So that's the situation we're in. God's justice revealed. God shows his justice. I've mentioned a number of passages and there's lots and lots in the Psalms and we see this in Genesis 18, in the letters, in the book of Revelation. God is the perfect judge revealed in his word. God reveals his justice in our hearts too. People everywhere, throughout the world, of any religion or none, have a sense of right and wrong. And everywhere it seems to be true that people have a sense, this is right and this is wrong. And I know that sometimes I've done what's wrong. It's a universal knowledge that people have. C.S. Lewis, that he, was a, he grew up as an atheist until he was in his adulthood, he remained an atheist, and then he came to faith in Christ and went on to become the greatest Christian writer of the 20th century. And he said, the great chink in my armor as an atheist was the knowledge of right and wrong, because how could I know what's right and what's wrong without there being a source of right and wrong? Some God, I can't be angry at God for not existing. That doesn't make sense. He said, how could a person know that a line is crooked if you don't have an idea of a straight line? And so we have this inborn sense this longing for justice. And when we see injustice, particularly when the injustice happens to you, right, you get really mad at what somebody, a drunk driver, an unfaithful spouse, a crooked lawyer, a business partner who ripped you off. When it happens to you, it's really, you really have that sense of justice. There needs to be justice in the world. Um, Romans chapter two, verse 14, yeah, this is very interesting. <clears throat> Paul is writing, when Gentiles, who don't have the law, they don't have the God-given, written statement of what's right and wrong. When they do by nature things required by the law, they're a law for themselves, even, they don't have, even though they don't have the law. Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences bearing witness, their thoughts now accusing, now defending them. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. This inner sense of right and wrong in our hearts that people have. There's an interesting example in the book of Acts. Paul, with about 300 people, was on a ship bound for Rome, and they were wrecked off the little island of Malta in the middle of the Mediterranean, and they got ashore. Everybody survived, but they were freezing and soaking wet, and the natives very friendly built a fire, and Paul got some brushwood to throw on the fire and probably warmed by the heat of the fire, a viper, a poisonous snake, crawled out of the brushwood and sunk its teeth into Paul's arm. And so the natives who are just pagans on this island, the Maltese, say, he must be a murderer and he's escaped drowning in the sea, but now God's going to get him through this poisonous snake. And then by a miracle, Paul wasn't harmed by the snake, just shook it off into the fire. And the natives then said he must be a god. But the example is they knew this sense, bad things, when people do bad things, bad things should happen to them, and when people do good things, good things should happen to them. And it doesn't always work out that way, but people have this sense that's the way it ought to be, because <clears throat> scripture and then in our hearts, God has put this sense of right and wrong. And above all, on the cross, God shows his justice. God hates sin, hates our bad choices because of what they do, what they do to ourselves, what they do to other people, and the way they cut us off from God. And so God is angry about sin because of the harm that it does. And um, Romans, again, Romans chapter 3, 35, yeah, when he talks about what God has done on the cross. Yeah. This is Romans uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 25. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice, because his, in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. 
He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. There's a huge problem. We're all aware of it. We see it in the papers, we see it on TV, we see it within ourselves, in our relationships, of people making bad choices. Bad choices have consequences. There is a price to be paid. And it's not just that we've hurt ourselves and hurt each other, but that we've offended against God. We've offended against an infinite being. And so there's infinite consequences. That price has to be paid. There's no way we could pay off for the wrong we've done in the face of the justice of God. But God came in Jesus. Jesus who is God in human form. Jesus who lived a perfect sinless life can do what nobody else could do. Pay the price for all our wrong choices. To reunite us with God so we can be part of God's family. The cross shows both the huge love of God for us and the anger of God against sin. And it's not that God took it out on Jesus. In Colossians uh, chapter, no, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.19, Paul writes, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God took the penalty on himself to pay the price. The judge taking the penalty for us. That hymn that we sometimes sing before the throne of God above. The second verse, it's a beautiful old 19th century hymn that's been set to a modern Celtic tune. It's very lovely. And it says, When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, I look above and see him there who put an end to all my sin. Since Christ the Savior, the, since Christ the sinless Savior died, God above is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. The cross shows the justice of God. It shows how awful the results of bad choices are. And at the same time, God, as Paul writes, justifies those who have faith in Jesus, justifies the ungodly, gives us his justice. So God is just. <clears throat> he has perfect justice, and he justifies us, even though we never deserved it, by trusting in him. And people say, dealing with the justice of God, how can a good God send people to hell? And he doesn't send people to hell. Anybody who goes to hell gets there under their own steam. C.S. Lewis again puts it in two ways. He says there's two kinds of people in the world. The people who say to God, Thy will be done. And the people to whom God says, Thy will be done. People who make the choice, I don't want any part of it. God respects our choices. He created us as beings who are free to choose. And tragically, people choose to have no part of God. People say, couldn't God do something? Couldn't God do something to bring those? What more could He do that He hasn't done? Could He pay the price? to cover all the wrong choices they've made? He's done that. Could he forgive them? They don't want to be forgiven. Could he just leave them alone? Tragically, that's what people ask to do. So, <clears throat> God has given. People say, couldn't God do something to change them? God has given us his Holy Spirit to work miraculously within your hearts to change you, to make you more holy and more loving, people have rejected it. So, in the justice of God, people have made that choice. They don't want any part of God, and God allows them to respect that choice. So, <clears throat> God is perfectly just. And on the cross, we see that justice fulfilled. He paid the price for all of our sin. He won the victory for us, so that we can simply come to the cross and lay our burdens down there. So how do we respond to that? Well, the first way of response is to embrace Jesus, to trust in Him. And I put a little prayer at the end of the insert here, which we will say uh, before we come to the Lord's table to take communion, which could be a recommitment to Christ, or if it's the first time you're praying such a prayer, let me know about it. Make it your step of faith in Christ. So the first is to embrace Jesus. Second, in response to God's justice, recognize that God is just. Romans 12, 
verse 9. He talks about, Paul talks about that. Take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And some of us here have really been done in by somebody else. I don't know what it was. I've mentioned some of the possibilities. And it's so easy to hang on to bitterness and dream of revenge. God says, let it go. God says, I'm the just judge. Everybody will get the desserts. I will deal with it. The person may repent. And then there's provision for that. But says, so, so first, embrace Christ. Second, don't hang on to bitterness. Don't hang on to revenge. None of that. Third thing in response to God's justice, work for justice in this world. And one of the examples that a lot of Christians are being involved in now is fighting against human trafficking. Slavery was abolished in the British Empire in 1804. The slave trade in 1804. Slavery in 1834, slavery was abolished in this country in 1865, and yet, even in the Bay Area, there are people being sold, particularly in the sex trade, and Christians are fighting against this, and there's a place because God is just for us to fight for justice in this world, and then celebrate God is just. We have, as I said, this in our hearts, this longing for real justice, to see it play out and we can celebrate knowing that God is just. And I'll read the last few verses of Psalm 96. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound of all that's in it. Let the fields be jubilant of everything in them. All the trees of the forest will sing for joy. They will sing before the Lord. For He comes, He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in His truth. God's justice is something not to be afraid of, but to celebrate. In Christ, he's made a way for us to be made right, for his righteousness, his justice to be put on us as we receive it by trusting in him. And so we can celebrate, as so many of the Psalms do, that God is just, that his justice, his judgment will come on the earth. And so assess our priorities. I put that on the insert here, didn't I? Our relationships, our money, our time, our work, all of that things, to see when Jesus comes and will he say, well done, good and faithful servant. Or will he say, you trust in me, you're in, but what on earth were you doing with those gifts that I gave you during your lifetime? What do you think about that? So assess. We face the justice of God. God is good and loving. He's made a way. He's made provision. He's shown his perfect justice on the cross to give us his justice and his righteousness. So I'd like us to say together this little prayer printed at the back of the insert here. A prayer of commitment to Christ, which is often a most of us a prayer of recommitment just to cement that and remind us of it. But if it's the first time, make this the time you commit to Christ your life. Okay, together. Dear Lord God, I thank you for your love. I'm sorry for all my bad choices. I accept that Jesus Christ died to pay for all my wrongs. I trust you, Jesus, with my life. I receive you as living, resurrected Lord. I will follow you as you give me strength. Thank you for the free gift of everlasting life, which on my own I could never earn or deserve. Thank you, Jesus, for that amazing gift, which we could never have suspected would happen, and yet it works. Your love works to change our lives, to reconcile us with you. Thank you, God, for that amazing gift. God, we ask for your grace on those who mourn, who miss loved ones, your warm presence with them. We ask for your grace in our homes to fill them with your love and your joy and your peace. We ask for your healing power in the bodies of those who are sick. And we ask for your resurrection, new life, 
in the lives, the hearts and minds of those we know who don't know you. Use us, Lord, to bring this good news out into the world, in our neighborhoods and around the world. Thank you, Lord. And God, as we come to this table, in which you are both the host and the meal, Lord Jesus, we prepare to meet you anew. And we sum up our prayers in the prayer which you taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. After you come.